Father, prepare my heart and prepare my mouth. Help me teach this as you would intend. Let the words come out as you desire. And Father, as they are shared with this room by your Spirit, move us all, Father, to the place we need to be to follow you in more obedience and to your pleasure. I ask, Father, that as you grow us individually in what we learn, you'd also be growing us as a community, knowing that we are stronger together than individually. And in that strength, Father, I pray that you would help us reach more and more people in this city. First, for the purpose of bringing them into the kingdom by faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. And then, as they come into the kingdom, Father, let us have the privilege to disciple them in your word, so that they may be ready to serve you in the day they see you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's pick right back up where we left off last week. We are at a crucial moment in the story of Christ in the Gospels. We are at the point where Israel lost the kingdom. He has healed a mute, demon-possessed man in the beginning of this chapter, about the middle point of this chapter. And as I explained last week, this is one of those unique miracles that we call the Messianic miracles. These are miracles unique to the Messiah that are like a calling card. When you see this miracle, you know you're looking at the Messiah. And as the crowd saw Jesus heal this man, we noticed last week in verse 23 that the crowd immediately recognized the miracle for what it was and for what it meant. They say in verse 23, this cannot be the son of David, can he? A recognition that they had just seen him perform a miracle that marked him as the son of David, that is, as the Messiah. They asked the religious leaders who were standing by to rule on that question. Should they trust this man? Is this, in fact, our Messiah? And the religious leaders, you remember, responded by asserting that Jesus was operating not as God, but with the power of Satan, they said. Verse 24, they tell the crowd, Jesus performed this surprising miracle by the power of the ruler of the demons. And then Jesus responds to that, to their answer, and he says, it is patently ridiculous to suggest that I am working with Satan's power, because Satan would never act against his own demons in that way. The real answer, Jesus said in verse 28, was he was working with the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of the Spirit of God. And if so, he said that meant the kingdom of God was at hand. The kingdom of God had come, which is the reasonable interpretation, the reasonable conclusion they should have come to, but they didn't. And so let's pick up there, verse 31. Therefore I say to you, he says, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people, but blasphemy against the Spirit shall not be forgiven. Whoever speaks a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it shall not be forgiven him, either in this age or in the age to come. All right, well, Christ's words in verse 31 and 32 are well known. Many Bible students have heard this passage, I'm sure. But they're just as commonly misunderstood, in my experience. And we've come to calling his statement here, the unforgivable sin. And if you've ever studied this section of Scripture before, I'm sure you've heard a lot of people explaining what they think this is all about. Maybe you've made some assumptions of your own, right? It's kind of an intriguing area of Scripture, right? A little of a, of a conundrum here. Can there be something that can't be forgiven? It almost feels like that, that, that silly thing people say, can God make a rock so big he can't lift it? You know, it, it feels like you're being led into a trap. Some have assumed that Jesus was speaking simply about the sin of unbelief. That simply not believing in Jesus is a sin that precludes forgiveness. And you can even find young people today who make a game out of attempting to commit this sin intentionally. They utter profane things against the Holy Spirit in videos that they then post on the internet. And they do so claiming that now I'm unforgivable. And they're mocking God. It's a game. Well, thankfully, for the sake of those misguided souls, they have grossly misunderstood this passage. And we're going to understand this passage properly tonight, and we're going to do it by allowing the context in which these, this statement is made to dictate our understanding of what Jesus meant, which is, by the way, the way you understand any passage of Scripture, right? So let's start with a simple definition, blaspheming. Blaspheming is the diminishing or the slandering of God's work or of His words or of his character. So blaspheming in any of its forms is a sin, obviously. And there are a lot of ways you could go about committing this sin. I mean, even just taking the Lord's name in vain is a form of blasphemy because you've slandered or diminished something that is holy. But that just begs the question, is Jesus suggesting then that you and I cannot be forgiven for such an utterance, for blasphemy? 
And for that matter, are the provocateurs that are on YouTube doing their thing, are they cut off from God's grace? Well, simply put, the answer is no. And there are two reasons that I can say without a doubt that that is the case. That no, you are not cut off from the grace of God by whatever you might utter, blasphemy or otherwise. Neither are those YouTubers. And the answer for why it's no starts right away in what Jesus himself said. And you may have overlooked it. Look at verse 31 again. Look at the beginning of verse 31. To make sure that you and I knew that Jesus was not referring to individual sin, he gives us this explicit exception right up front. Notice he says, any sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven people. There you have it. In fact, the word people there could have been translated more individuals. In other words, he said there is no sin that you and I can commit that is unforgivable by the blood of Christ. No individual sin. No exceptions. He just said it. You don't even have to go further than the first half of verse 31 to see it. Which tells you that the sin of blaspheming the Holy Spirit must be something else entirely. It must be something other than the sin that people can commit. The individual sins of people. It's not a sin that's committed by someone individually, and therefore there is simply no such thing as a sin that an individual can commit which is not forgivable. There is no such thing. The second reason we know that to be true is that the entire testimony of the Bible confirms this. I mean, time doesn't permit me to go through all the verses that offer a conclusive statement to the contrary that says that you can do something God can't forgive. But let me just give you one that says it plainly. Paul says in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13, Speaking to the church, he says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him. God the Father made you alive together with Christ, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, and He has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. Now you notice Paul says that Christ has forgiven us of all. Our transgressions. Not just the easy ones, not just some of them, not all except for that one unforgivable. No, all. And that's the testimony of Scripture. There is no sin left uncovered, no sin left unforgiven by faith in Christ. Period. And furthermore, once you've been declared uh, not guilty, declared justified by your faith in Jesus Christ, Paul goes on to say elsewhere in, in Romans that that declaration by God will never, ever, ever, ever change. Paul says in Romans 8.1, as you probably know, Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Period. He says plainly that the believer never experiences condemnation from God having placed their faith in Jesus Christ. The righteousness that you receive when you put your faith in Jesus is not of yourselves. You knew that, right? It was Christ's righteousness given to you, assigned to you. So what we're saying is, you are righteous, you are good, you are approved, you are vindicated by God, not for anything you've ever done, but because Christ did a perfect thing in His life and you've been assigned His righteousness. Now, knowing that, how could you ever be less than righteous? Can you make Christ less righteous? No. Is the righteousness you receive from Christ something you can throw back into God's lap? Did you, did you gain it by your own effort in the first place? In other words, if you understand how you are saved, you also immediately understand that this appointing of God, this assigning of God, uh, Christ's righteousness to you, is something done for you, to you, by God, and not something you have any control over. He cleared your account in heaven. You don't have access to the ledger. You can't go up there and change what it says. You've been declared righteous. You've been acquitted, the Bible says, justified. If you go to a court today and you are acquitted, you cannot tell the judge to reverse the decision. Did you know that? If you're acquitted, you cannot confess and, and plead guilty. They'll simply say, get out of my court. The decision has been rendered. It's been made. There's no going back on it. You see that? I mean, if we do that in our courts, do you think God's court works with any less certainty? And then God's own declaration in later in Romans 8 makes clear that this will never change. Romans 8, 31. He says, What shall we say then? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. So here's the point I'm making. 
Not only did Jesus say in verse 31, any sin will be forgiven. The Bible says that having put your faith in Christ, you are acquitted. And Paul says, if God is the one saying you're innocent, who's left to say you're guilty? Who can challenge God's decree? And God does not change his mind. So simply put, you didn't earn your salvation when you obtained it. And you can't unearn your salvation by anything you do after you're saved. That's not licensed to sin. Please don't go take it that way. But I don't care what you do. You're not going to lose your salvation because of anything you did. You don't earn it by works. You don't lose it by works. It's not about works. Your faith made you acquitted. You're forever that way. Done. And I understand there are some very smart people, very learned people, very mature Christians who would teach you that you can lose your salvation. And I don't intend to... To judge them here, I'm not intending to indict them here. I'm just telling you they're wrong. (laughs) And why do I say that with so much certainty? Because this says it. And I'm sorry they've missed it. It's just proof to you that smart people can be wrong. I can be wrong. Anyone can be wrong. And if you think someone with a PhD and doctor so-and-so and pastor for 40 years, if you think that makes them right, guess what? You're wrong everywhere they're wrong. That's all that means. And you'll be wrong where I'm wrong unless you listen to other teaching and and balance that, right? So no one's perfect. You need to understand what the Bible says, not what so-and-so says. And I'm telling you what the Bible says, because I read it to you. So we know conclusively there is no such thing as an unforgivable sin. Now, yes, if you haven't put your faith in Christ, then your sins are not forgiven. But that's not the issue. Jesus didn't say that there are unforgiven sins. That's the case for every unbeliever, but that's not even the point. The point is, there could be a sin for which there is not forgiveness, but that's not true for an individual. So personal sin is forgiven by the blood of Christ. What then is the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? It must be that the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit is a term that Jesus is using to describe what's going on in the moment. And what's going on in the moment? Well, you have Israel rejecting Jesus as their king, rejecting Jesus as their Messiah. Israel blasphemed the Spirit's testimony when they claimed that Jesus' miracles were being done by the power of Satan. That specifically is blaspheming the Holy Spirit. Remember, Jesus said earlier that he was accomplishing these miracles of healing, this miracle of healing the mute demon. He says, what if I do this by the Spirit of God? He was saying, I just did something by the power of the Spirit of God in me, and through that demonstration, a testimony was just given to you by the Spirit. What they heard and saw told them, this can't be the Son of David, can it? When the Pharisees said, no, 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 that's the demons, they said, oh, okay, that's the demons then. They blasphemed the Holy Spirit. They made a statement. They came to a belief that was contrary to what the Spirit himself had testified. And Jesus said, this national sin, this collective sin of Israel to reject their Messiah is unforgivable. Unforgivable. As a result of that error, the Lord is now going to withdraw the offer of the kingdom from that generation of Israel. Remember I said last week, Jesus is not going to walk around the Galilee forever offering the kingdom, right? Either Israel is going to embrace Jesus as their Messiah while he's there offering it, or they don't. And, you know, sooner or later, the offer was going to be taken off the table. Jesus was not going to walk around for a thousand years offering the kingdom to Israel. There was a limit. And begs the question, what's the limit? Well, this is the limit. When he's made the the, the overture by the power of the Spirit to demonstrate who he is, satisfactory to the point that they recognize it, and yet they turn around and say it's the devil, game over. It's done. We're, We're not offering it anymore. And he says, you commit the unpardonable sin, there's no going back. Notice what Jesus says at the end of verse 32. He says, Israel won't see the kingdom appear as a result of this sin in this age or in the age to come. Now, this age, or the present age, refers to the period of Jesus walking the earth, offering the kingdom, this moment that we've been talking about, this opportunity that's now lost. So clearly they aren't getting the the kingdom in this age. And then what is the age to come? Now, some have argued that the age to come is the age of the kingdom. Well, in most cases, that would probably be a safe interpretation. Here's the problem in this case. If you say that Israel is not going to be forgiven of this sin in the age to come, then what you're implying is Israel won't be in the kingdom. And yet we know that's not true. The Bible is clear on that, that Israel will be in the kingdom. So I'm going to tell you that the age to come is not the kingdom age, but is the church age. It's the age we're in now. It's the age that follows Jesus' ascension and the beginning of Pentecost. That is to say that Israel will not get their kingdom while Jesus was with them, and they're not going to get the kingdom in the church age either. They're going to have to wait longer than that. 
Paul describes it this way. In Romans 11.7, he says, Speaking of Israel's lack of kingdom, the fact that Israel didn't get the kingdom, didn't get their Messiah, Romans 11.7, Paul says, What then? What Israel is seeking, it is not obtained. But those who were chosen obtained it, and the rest were hardened. Just as it is written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes to see not, ears to hear not, down to this very day. And David says, Let their table become a snare and a trap and a stumbling block and a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened to see not and bend their backs forever. What he's quoting from, of course, are Old Testament scriptures that prophesied the fact that Israel would be essentially pushed off by the Father, kept away from knowing the truth about Messiah. Why would God ever do that to his people? Because they committed the unpardonable sin. Because of what they did, it put them in a position not to receive what they had been seeking, Paul said. Only a minority, only a remnant received it, according to God's choice. The rest were hardened and kept that way for a time. How long? In this age and in the age to come. For the time of the church, the church is now the, pro- the, the emphasis. The kingdom program is now the emphasis. While Israel is being kept, being prepared for the future, not to, not to go away, not to be uh, forsaken... But they're not getting the kingdom right now because of what they did. And Paul adds this in Romans 11, 11. I say then, they did not stumble so as to fall, did they? And he says, no, may it never be. But by their transgression, that transgression is their unpardonable sin. By their transgression, salvation has come to the Gentiles to make them jealous. So Israel's unforgivable sin, remember, this is a national sin, not an individual sin. The national sin of rejecting their Messiah led God to harden the hearts of his people to a degree so that the the kingdom would remain outside their grasp for a time and come to the Gentiles instead for this period of this age. But let me emphasize this. We're talking here about a national sin. So the consequence is national. The consequence is no no more individual than the sin was. Israel's national sin does not preclude, hear me on this, this national sin that Israel committed does not preclude individual Jews from coming to faith. All right, And you see proof of this in the New Testament. I want you to think of all the Jews who were part of the nation when Israel rejected their Messiah. They were part collectively of the nation when it committed the unpardonable sin. And yet, they lived on later and came to faith in Jesus Christ. You can think of examples with me, right? Think about Jesus' earthly brothers. James, Jude, they wrote two of the New Testament epistles. They came to faith. How about the Apostle Paul? He was alive, probably a very young man, but he was alive. How about the 3,000 Jews at Pentecost? Right, so these are Jews who were part of the national sin in the sense that they were part of the nation. They too did not see the kingdom appear. They too did not receive it as they could have. But individually they came to faith and became part of the church. All right, verse 32, Jesus confirms for us that personal salvation will be possible. Notice he says, a word spoken against the Son of Man shall be forgiven. What's a word spoken against the Son of Man? Well, Son of Man is a reference to to the Messiah, to Jesus. So we're saying, you can say something negative against Christ's testimony to be Messiah. And that can be forgiven. When Israel spoke a word against the Son of Man, when they looked at Jesus and said, you're not my Messiah, I don't believe in you. Or when a Jew today, as you might see, spits at the name of Jesus, which is sometimes what you'll see among Orthodox Jews. They are saying a word, as it were, against the Son of Man. But that can be forgiven on a personal level. If that same person comes to faith in Jesus the next day, everything before that and everything after that is forgiven just like it was for you and me. Okay? The only deadline for individual forgiveness is the death of your body. That's it. That's the only deadline. It's a real one, though. You're appointed to die once and then comes judgment. So it's a real deadline, but it's the only one. And therefore, the unforgivable sin cannot be repeated. Not today, not yesterday, not any day since it happened, because it was a very unique, specific moment. It was the moment that the nation of Israel rejected the person of Jesus as the Spirit of God testified through him by miracles in their presence. Try repeating that today. What do you need? Well, you need Israel. You need to be Jew. You need to be facing the living Christ incarnate, walking the earth again. And he has to be doing miracles in front of you that he is asking you to believe so that you can become the nation that he gives the kingdom to. That's not going to happen again. That happened once. And that sin happened once. And the consequences are still going on today for Israel. And they will go on until such time as God puts an end to this. So having declared the end of the kingdom, 
He now condemns this generation of Israel for having lost the kingdom. Look at verse 33. He says to them, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you, being evil, speak what is good? For the mouth speaks out of that which fills the heart. The good man brings out of his good treasure what is good. And the evil man brings out of his evil treasure what is evil. Here's what he's saying. And actually at this point, verse 33 and onward, Jesus essentially begins to act as a prosecutor and judge, throwing the book at Israel for having made the unpardonable sin. And he starts, in this declaration of judging against them, he starts by indicting their poor judge of authority. This is where the problem began. He says, look, you should either make the tree good or make the tree bad. Which is a way of saying that uh, if Jesus was truly working with Satan, as they accused him of, then just call me evil. Call me evil. My deeds are evil. Everything about me should be evil. If I'm doing everything I'm doing because I've got a Satan, Satan's demon in me, well then, I'd never do anything good. And conversely, he says, the Pharisees, they're a brood of vipers. You know, that brood of viper phrase, we heard that earlier referring, when John the Baptist talked to them, he said the same thing. And it's a, it's a, it's a very subtle way of calling them children of the devil. Because it's children, brood is actually the word children, and viper here refers to a serpent. He's, he's calling them children of the devil. And he says, you children of the devil, you got nothing but evil inside you. So he's saying, judge us by our fruit. You think I got a devil in me? What do you see in me? And if they had thought even a minute about it, they would have said, well, we see you teaching good things, doing good things, healing people, kind, merciful, loving. That's what we've seen. And then think about that. The first time somebody suggested that Jesus had a demon in him, they said, oh, that makes perfect sense. No, it doesn't. Nothing he's done, nothing he's said, squares up with that assessment. It's a completely bizarre conclusion. And, on the other hand, the Pharisees are people who, you know, the, the people of that day were not idiots. They understood the kind of leaders they had. They knew what they were really like. These men were hypocrites. They lied. They were lovers of money. They schemed. They knew how that worked. And they could have seen for themselves that these guys have nothing good in them. Look at this. They've chosen the word of people like that over Jesus with all that he's done. He says, look, you can't have it both ways. You can't love me for all that I do and then turn around and say that I have a demon in me when it suits you. Either make me good or make me bad. In verse 34, he uses that phrase, brood of vipers, because he wants to make clear to the crowd, you chose wrong. You picked the wrong side. And so he formally pronounces judgment on them now. In verse 36, he says, But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Now I know you can take these verses out of context and make a good application to... To us, right? We could start going off on a, on a tangent about how you use your mouth and what you say. And, but you know what? If you look at this properly in context, it's not talking about believers at all because it says you'll be condemned by what you say. Christian, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, there is now no condemnation. I'm not saying you should just do whatever you want, but I'm saying you don't have to worry about it coming back upon your head in condemnation. There is now no condemnation. So that tells us that we're talking here about something different. This, this may be a principle of, uh, of good speech that you can find elsewhere, like what James says, for example. That's fair. But this is not the place you go to tell a believer to watch what they say. This is talking to a group of unbelievers who have just committed the national unpardonable sin of rejecting their Messiah, and they did it through careless words. Through a casual, oh, he's got a demon in him. You know, you ought to think twice about what you just said. Jesus says, this generation, the one of Israel, would be convicted by that statement. Now, I don't think there's ever been a time in history when anyone accomplished more evil for themselves with a simpler statement. Think about that. This is, I would say there's been no more offensive thing said about God in the whole of history than that. Because Jesus, on the one hand, is the name above all names, the king above all kings, the Alpha, the Omega, the Creator. He literally, think about this for a minute, Jesus literally made every one of those men that were standing there telling him that he has a demon in him. He made them. He created them, along with everything else. Moreover, he is the salvation of men. He is the perfect sacrifice. He is the healer, the provider, the light of the world, the perfect love of God. And we could go on and on and on. There he is. And to that, 
You have, on the other hand, the devil, to whom he was compared. The devil. What do we know about him? He is the source of all evil that the world has ever known. You know, whether it came directly by him, or it came as a result of things he's done, you can trace every act of evil. I mean, if you think about what's in the news these days, this thing about stuff that you read about, and you think, how can anyone ever even do that? That is because of the devil, ultimately. I'm not saying that the devil made them do it. I'm saying that if you trace it all back, the father of lies, the one who was a murderer from the beginning, is ultimately responsible for that. Is there a bigger contrast? Can you get more diametrically opposed in any comparison you choose to make between Jesus and the devil? Can there be a more discontinuous kind of, you know, more, more paradoxical comparison than that? And he just said that. They just said that. And Jesus called those careless words. Maybe one of the biggest understatements of the entire Bible. You know? They did it without... And I think he's right. I mean, it's an accurate statement. They didn't think about it. They weren't thinking about what they were just doing. No one ever stopped and said, Well, guys, before we say that, let's just double-check our math here. Because if this guy really is the Messiah, I mean, we don't want to call him the devil. That's not going to work. No, they just said it easily. Get it out of the way. Don't worry about it. He's the devil. Let's ignore him. Jesus said, Okay, careless words. But they're going to come back. They're going to come back. They might have been spoken carelessly. They might have been spoken without thought. But that does not lessen the offense. That nation would suffer a great loss. And if you, can, if you know anything about the history of Israel, or just that part of the world, think about all that's transpired since AD 30 and today, in which Israel has suffered in their land, outside their land, in one pogrom after another, the Holocaust, everything in between. All of that has happened, not, a, not as so much as God deciding to hurt His people, but God putting them in that position, putting them outside the land, putting them in a position that they have had to suffer through because of those careless words. He says in verse 37, By your words you will be justified, by your words you will be condemned. You know, that's how God's justice works, by the way. I mean, I know we, we speak at times quite often about God's love and mercy, as so we should, because that's what we've received in faith. But you know, mercy and grace and love, those are meaningless terms, meaningless, if you divorce them from the other side of God's nature, which is wrath and judgment, the things that come against those who have not received Christ, if you take that out of the equation and you make God a, a grandfather in a rocking chair who never says anything wrong, never does anything wrong, never, never cares to hurt anybody, never makes anybody suffer, there is no such thing as hell, as some would tell you. If that's your vision of God, you may think you're doing Him a favor by painting Him in some favorable light, but you have diminished Him because you have removed half of Him. You have taken His character and made it a two-dimensional caricature of God, one of your own liking. And in the process, you've diminished grace. Because if you don't have darkness, you don't know what light is. If you can't get fired, you work for the post office. And as a result, (laughs) you see what happens. If there's any postal workers here, I hope you don't know my address. No, I mean, that's the fact, right? You have to understand, I like to say it this way, you have to know what you've been saved from to appreciate the grace you've received, right? And Jesus is saying this very matter-of-factly. Your words are what's going to matter. You know, you might think you're a good person by what you do on some given day, but at the heart of it, who you are here comes out here. And he says, you can be justified by your words or you can be convicted by them. And of course, to be justified means to confess Christ And you think about the mercy of God in this for just a minute. You might think it's a little harsh that he could do so much to Israel just because of a few careless words. Okay, flip that around for a moment. How much are you going to receive in all the eternity that still comes just because you said a few words? You ever thought about it that way? All the sin you've ever done, in fact, you're still doing it. Let's all be honest about this, right? All the sin that makes up your life and my life, maybe it's less now than it used to be, that's our hope, but the point is it's still happening. Put all that together, pile that up, what do you deserve? What, is it, what, what do you think God should get out of you in order to give you something better than what you deserve? You know, is it just a few little words? And yet that's how he's designed the gospel. That's how he's designed salvation. It's accompanied by faith, I understand that. But when you think about what you have to do, the actions that manifest, it's just a few words. So let's hold him to the same standard, right? If he can bring us so much glory for a few words, then we can't judge him for bringing the opposite for 
a few words. Careless words. Luke 12, 8, Jesus says this, I say to you, everyone who confesses me before men, the Son of Man will confess him also before the angels of God. But he who denies me before men, he will be denied before the angels of God. I mean, that's a fair trade-off. All right, now at this point, the Pharisees are going to try to recover a little bit by engaging in a, in a conversation with Jesus about their desire for more proof of his claims. Now, let me just say, from verses 38 through 50, we're not going to cover that tonight. This is Jesus denying their request to get more proof. And as he does it, he points out that they're not sincere anyway. And they've had all the proof they need. They haven't lacked for signs. We're going to get back to this next week. But for today, I need to cover one more thing. And, and the time is, is pushing on us a little bit, but we've, we've got to get through this. Okay, it's important. So just hold with me a little longer. Matthew does not record something here that we need to see. It's an important footnote to this moment of the unforgivable sin. There's two times in which Jesus makes a statement related to this moment. Once now and once near the end of his ministry, in the days right before he dies, Matthew records the second one, but he doesn't record the first one. Luke records the first one. So we know it was said twice. And I want to tell you what he said here, and I'm going to go to Luke to show it to you. It's in Luke chapter 13. I'm just going to read these verses. It might help if you can see them in front of you, but it's Luke 13, 34. And in Luke 13, 34, remember, this is in the same general moment, not necessarily the same instant, but it's in the same general time. As Jesus has seen them commit this unpardonable sin, as He's told them that they're now done for, they've made the mistake that can't be reversed, He gets to this statement. Verse 34, He says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together, just as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not have it. Behold, your house is left to you desolate. And I say to you, you will not see me until the time comes when you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now those are parting words, as it were, and they come in again. Jesus says something similar again right near the end of his earthly life. He speaks it as a lament. I want you to hear it that way. He says, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem. You can almost sense his disappointment here, right? With what his people have done to him, what they've done in rejecting him. And I have to believe he also knows what's coming. And so it's, it's in the back of his mind, you have no idea what is coming for you and how you have set this nation on a path of, of misery for years, thousands of years, because of what you just did. And when he says here, the, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Jerusalem in this context is really representative of the whole nation. It's like you call a nation by its capital city, you're really referring to the whole of it. He's saying, you guys have, are in for it. But he says, it's not what I wanted. He says, you know, prophet after prophet came to you with the word of God telling you what would come, when it would come, how it would come. You just had to be ready to look for it. It's not like this was a surprise. And then he says, time and time again, you responded to that grace by rejecting the message and assaulting those messengers. The prophets, you know, you know they were consistently mistreated. I mean, the worst job you could ever have in Israel was be a prophet. I mean, seriously, you go to Hebrews 11 and there's this list of all the things they did to the prophets of the Old Testament. It's just horrendous, sawing them in two and stuff, right? Terrible job. And time and time again, God just keeps sending him messengers, telling him what's coming. And you know why he was doing that? Jesus says, I was just trying to gather you as my people, like a mother hen gathers her children, gathers chicks. He picks the perfect Comparison. I mean, most of us don't farm anymore, so we don't have this readily available. Let me just read a little blurb on, on hens. Okay, This comes from the first century, Roman historian Plutarch. And he praises the mothering of hens as an example. He says, They protect their ch chicks by drooping their wings for some to creep under and receiving with joyous and affectionate clucks others that mount upon their backs or run up to them from every direction. And though they flee from dogs and snakes... If they are frightened only for themselves, the mother hen, in their fright for their children, will stand their ground and fight out beyond their strength. And then the Renaissance writer, a man named Ulysses Androvandi, describes uh, how chicks work with their mother hens this way. He says, At the first sign of a predator, mother hens will immediately gather their chicks under the shadow of their wings, and with this covering they put up such a fierce defense... Striking fear into their opponent in the midst of a frightful clamor using wings and beak that they would rather die for their chicks than seek safety in flight. Similarly, in collecting food, the mother hen allows her chicks to eat their fill before satisfying her own hunger. 
He says thus, Mother hens present in every way a noble example of love for the offspring. That's just, I love that. I mean, Jesus was so desperately desiring to do effectively that for his people Israel. And here's Israel so hard-hearted that they fail to recognize Jesus in that loving desire as he comes to them offering the kingdom to them. And that's why Christ came, by the way. You know, he lowered himself, took the form of man, lived on earth, ultimately went to the cross for one reason, to establish his kingdom and bring the children of God into that kingdom with him, chief among them, Israel. And Jesus says, Israel would not have it. They wouldn't have it. They rejected his offer of the kingdom. I wonder what gives them so much ignorance, right? Did they not understand what was at risk? Did they not value what he was offering? I mean, it's hard to explain when they knew what they were looking at, and yet they went the other way, isn't it? It's, it, it's a really good picture of the willful disobedience and ignorance of the human heart. We do it all in different ways ourselves. This is the national poster child for that. So in verse 35, and this is where we end tonight, Jesus declares, this is verse 35 of Luke, He declares that Israel's house was left desolate. Desolate just means like a desert, like a wasteland, empty, dry. And that term house is a reference to two things. It's both the temple specifically, it's also the nation's place in the land generally. So Jesus is saying, as a result of your rejection of me, your temple, and you in the land, it's all going to be gone. It's going to be desolate. And we know when this happened, historically, right? A.D. 70, the Roman you know, army came in to put down the rebellion that was underway at the time. When the fighting ended, that city was, was in ruins. The temple was in ruins all the way down to the foundation. We'll learn more about this in Matthew 24. And even after that, in the decades that followed, the, the Jewish people were pushed further and further outside their land. Uh, you get to the point in AD 134 when they were finally banned from Judea. Jews were literally banned by the Romans from being in the land. In the centuries that followed after that, you barely ever hear of them mentioned in the land. It's only been a very recent times that Israel has returned. And that in itself is a sign that we're coming near the end. That's the judgment. That's what they have suffered as a result of this moment. And then notice one last thing, verse 35, Jesus says, You will not see me until the time comes that you say. Hear that, hear that. He just said, you will not see me until. That little word until is hugely important. It says that there is still yet an opportunity coming for Israel to see their Messiah. And when you hear the word see, you need to understand it's meant in the same sense as the first time. They saw him physically on earth. They're going to see him on earth again. But this time he comes back to them because they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, those are not magic words. They actually come out of Psalm 118. And if you go read that psalm, it's spoken in the first person as Israel speaking, crying out to their Lord, confessing Christ, telling him that they want him. So in other words, what Jesus just said is, Nationally, you rejected me. So I'm leaving for a long time. And you will not see me again until nationally you confess my my name. Nationally you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A reference to the Messiah. So friends, what you're learning here is that the second coming of Christ to rule, to live on earth and rule, that second coming that we're all expecting, knowing that it will happen, being a part of it when it happens, that moment and the establishment of the kingdom that follows is dependent on on Israel confessing Christ. Not some of them, because some of them already have. All of them. When every Jew on earth receives Christ, collectively, the whole nation, Christ comes back. And as you hear that, you think, what on earth would ever let that happen? How in earth, on earth would that ever happen? We'll learn that later in Matthew 24. But if you're interested in knowing the answer a lot sooner... We will be doing a weekly study in the book of Revelation in this church starting in September. Okay? But now you need to know that the timing of that fateful day depends on Israel. That's why we say as Christians that the center of God's plan is Israel. Or as some have said, if you want to know where we are in the time clock of God's plan for the earth, just look at Israel. They're your clock. So knowing they've come back into the land of late tells us that we are getting closer to the point in which God is ready to finally... Come back to his people once more, give them the opportunity they missed 2,000 years ago. And as they receive it in the second time, we see the kingdom come for them, and we are there with them.
You see how momentous chapter 12 is of Matthew? As we finish this next week and get into what comes afterward, here's what you're going to start seeing as we wrap up. What you're going to start seeing is that because the kingdom offers off the table to Israel, Jesus has set his sights on what follows from that moment, which is a kingdom program of his apostles and their disciples beginning to recruit citizens for this new age in which Israel is no longer the emphasis, but Gentiles will be for a time. He begins preparing the kingdom program, which means he stops doing some things he's been doing, and he starts doing some different things he wasn't doing. We're going to look at that changeover when we get to the end of this chapter. But everything in chapter 13 and onward is different than what we've been seeing in chapters 1 through 12. It's like a whole restart, a resetting of his gospel ministry, in keeping with this fundamental shift in purpose. All right, friends, let's end there. And that's a lot of stuff to digest. I hope you'll take some time to to think about it and reflect on it, maybe ask some questions about it. Most of all, to understand that we are a part of this plan by faith and nothing's taken that away. Let's pray. Dear Father, as our worship team comes up and as we prepare our hearts to conclude in a moment of, of worship, Father, we worship you in your word first, which is to know that what you've told us is true, eternally so. It is useful for all instruction and for correction, reproof, for righteousness' sake, so that we might live according to what we've learned. We ask, Father, that what we've learned, as deep as it may be, as academic as it may sound to us now, nonetheless, Father, in what you've hidden in our hearts through it, I pray that it would help us minister in some new and better way. Perhaps it takes a fear away of what might come if we sin. Perhaps it sets our mind at ease about the security we have in you. And perhaps, Father, it helps us minister to those we might know in the Jewish faith just a little better in the meantime. We ask, Father, that you would give us all these opportunities to minister, to learn, to be secure, to be in your hands, in your arms. And, Father, help us continue to grow in your word as we continue in our study in weeks to come. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.